ESPN can't stop lying about Caitlin Clark. Last week they made one of the worst lists we've ever seen ranking the top 25 WNBA players this season. That list was stupid and it's why we ignored it. But this week they've just made another list ranking the best rookies from the 2024 season and not only is this list even worse, it completely exposes ESPN's hypocrisy. Because these two lists completely contradict each other despite being just weeks apart. So whatever reason reaction they were looking for, they are about to get it from me. Because Caitlin Clark was deliberately disrespected, I know exactly why they've done this, I'll explain why and stick around to the very end of the video to find out where I have Clark ranked. Spoiler alert, it's a lot higher than ESPN had her and it's gonna shock you. But let's start with the rookie rankings by ESPN. All season long Clark has been ranked way too low on this list. In the first month back in June, Cameron Brink was number one, Angel Reese was number two, and if you think they had Caitlin at number three, you'd be wrong. Matter of fact, Caitlin Clark wasn't even the highest rated player from the Iowa Hawkeyes, because Kate Martin, a player who by the way turned up at the draft to support Caitlin and ended up being surprised to be drafted herself, she was ranked number three. Rikia Jackson was number four. That's fine, she was up there. But it gets even more ridiculous, Julie Van Loo, a 32 year old rookie was number 5 and then finally we have Caitlin Clark at number 6. Now I understand that the fever started the season off terribly and Caitlin Clark had a slow start, but she still averaged 17.6 points and 6.6 assists in the month of May. Yes, she wasn't very efficient shooting 37% from the field, but clearly shooting percentage and a team's record can't be that important to this list criteria if Angel Reese has maintained the number one spot this entire time despite shooting 39% from the field this season and her team being in the Paige Becker sweepstakes. Now to say that Clark was disappointing at the beginning of the season as the number one pick is one thing, but to ignore her solid production and put her behind the likes of Kate Martin and Julie Van Loo was ludicrous even back then. Just because those two players far exceeded the low expectations people had of them doesn't mean they're better than somebody who was only underperforming in the context of the high standard she was held to. If you were to put the numbers on the screen, player A, player B, player C during this time period, it's clear and obvious who the best player was and in terms of difficulty, are we seriously comparing the number one pick coming into the league with all the hype, eyeball, scrutiny and responsibility of playing the hardest position on the court for the worst team in the league while being the focal point of opposing team scouting reports and also having a target on her back from other players trying to make a name for themselves against her to a role player like Kate Martin who's come in and and given some decent production off the bench for the two time reigning champions playing alongside the best player in the sport. I mean come on, the situations aren't even comparable and I don't even want to talk about Van Lu. She started playing professional basketball in 2003 and we're comparing her to Caitlin Clark who was born a year earlier in 2002. We need to really evaluate what a rookie is. Because you can't compare a player who's been playing professional basketball for 20 years to somebody who just turned pro a few months ago and call them both rookies. That list right there was comical, it doesn't get any worse than that, but their second list that came out in July was pretty bad too. Clark came in at number 2, but the way it was written in this article, they sold it as if it was fair, because Clark was the biggest riser on the list going up 4 spots. But she shouldn't have been that low to begin with. So you can't get away with slighting her again just because you had her so low originally and hide behind the fact that you bigged her up this time. Because by this point it was pretty clear that Clark was the best rookie in the draft class, she became the youngest player to record a triple double in WNBA history, she had some massive performances including two wins against the Chicago Sky. In fairness to Angel Reese, at least back then it was close-ish, I still think Clark should have been number one, but Angel Reese definitely had a stronger argument back then than she had in the most recent rookie lists that have come out since. Because the two of them have had historically great rookie seasons, Clark and Reese were both all stars their first year and were clearly ahead of the rest of the class, but ESPN continued to give the nod to Angel on the rookie ladder despite the fact that in the month of July, Clark separated herself from a great rookie player to one of the best players in the WNBA. She became the WNBA's assist leader averaging 12.5 assists in the month of July as well as 20 points per game. She broke the WNBA's single game assist record, was 
was Rookie of the Month and should have been strongly considered for Player of the Month too. I don't understand how Angel Reese remained ahead of Clark during this time period because you can't use the double-double argument in July because Clark averaged a double-double for the entire month. And I know nobody wants to talk about this, a double-double with 20 points and 13 assists is objectively more valuable and more impactful than a double-double with 14 points and 13 rebounds, which was what Reese averaged in July. In the month of July, Clark scored more points, was more efficient, her team had a better record, but she still came in second. Now where things really get ridiculous is the most recent list that came out a few days ago, based on the month of August. From the restart after the Olympic break, Caitlin Clark is still second. What more does she have to do to overtake Greece? In the month of August, Caitlin Clark elevated her game again. She averaged 24 points, 8.5 assists, she shot 37% from three point range and 47% from the field, and the fever went 5 and 1 during this time period. Angel Reese in the month of August averaged 12.1 points and 16.1 rebounds. She also shot 33% from the field and this guy went 1 of 5 during this time period. The two players played against each other. Clark had 28 points and 12 rebounds, won the game by double digit points, while Angel Reese had a double double where most of her stats came in garbage time. The question is, where's the consistency? When Clark was inefficient at the start of the year, it was held against her. When the Fever weren't winning games, it was held against her. And ESPN ranked her below role players. And shooting 33% from the field, she somehow maintains the top spot over a historically great rookie. I'm not trying to disrespect Angel Reese here. She's clearly number two. I think she's the best rebounder in the entire WNBA. And I think if she learns how to finish, she has the potential to be one of the greatest players of all time. I also think Caitlin Clark can be the greatest of all time. But we have to remember, Reese was the seventh pick in the draft. Her being second in Rookie of the Year is still a massive accomplishment. She still exceeded expectations and outperformed players selected ahead of her. So why, now that Clark is clearly pulled away, do we need to force this debate as if it's still close? I'll tell you exactly why they do it. It's two things. First of all, the media is trying to prop up Angel Reese because they want the storyline and the rivalry to continue from college like Magic and Bird because they know it sells. But unlike Magic and Bird though, Clark is and always has been the better player. Bird and Magic were close. They were both generational talents that came around at the same time and people followed their journeys from college into the NBA to actually find out who was better. Reese wasn't the second pick in the draft. There were other players that were considered better than her at the time in her own draft class. But since Reese has proven to be better than expected, the media are capitalizing. And with the double doubles and historic rebounding numbers, they can use that to justify the narratives that they're trying to push to make the two players seem closer than they actually are. It helps give your arguments credibility when you have all the greats from Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird, Cheryl Swoops, Lisa Leslie and other high profile people like Shaq and Stephen A. Smith going on television and telling everyone Reese's Rookie of the Year. It gives the narrative more validity because credible people who have your respect are saying it. But here's how you know it's all a facade. ESPN are hypocrites. Because if this Rookie of the Year race was as close as everyone's portraying it to be, why is it when you look at their odds, Caitlin Clark is the clear favourite to win? When it comes to opinions, everyone says it can go either way. But when Vegas gets involved and it's time to put money on it, suddenly it's very obvious who the winner is and who it's going to be. But that's not the only time ESPN have been hypocritical when it comes to these lists. Because as mentioned earlier, they released a whole different list that at the time completely contradicted the Rookie Ladder list. And that was their top 25 WNBA players. Now I would argue anyone still picking Reese to be Rookie of the Year over Clark is either stubborn or biased, but what we can all agree on is the hypocrisy from ESPN. Because how do you have Angel Reese as the number one rookie on the rookie list, but then Caitlin Clark is ahead of her on the WNBA's top 25 list? How does that make any sense? If Reese is ESPN's Rookie of the Year, why isn't she the highest rated rookie on the list? So that is flawed and flat out dumb. But also, the list itself is absolutely terrible. Because Caitlin Clark is ranked 15th on this list. Meaning there are 14 players in the WNBA right now better than her. That's ridiculous. And unlike a lot of these people in the media, I'm actually going to name names. Starting with the players who play the same position. Joe Lloyd at number 14. The Olympian who did nothing in the group project and still got an A. She averaged 3.2 points on 23% shooting during the Olympics. She's averaging 20.6 points per game in the W, shooting 36% from the field. Clark beats her in almost every single statistical category other than points. 
but it's not just Joe Lloyd. They have Ariki Ogunbowale ahead of Clark too. Now Ariki may lead all guards in scoring averaging 22.7 points per game, but she's also shooting 37% from the field and her team has the second worst record in the league. A bit like Joe Lloyd, she's got this great reputation as one of the league's best scorers, but if scoring's what you bring to the table and you aren't doing it efficiently and you also aren't winning, it doesn't matter. Now in terms of talent, Arike has an argument with anybody on this list, but production and impact, Caitlin Clark's ahead. Another one that's just ridiculous is Kelsey Plum, she's 11 on this list and if we're being honest, is there a single thing on a basketball court that she does better than Caitlin Clark? Truth be told, Kelsey Plum is a older, shorter, poor man's version of Caitlin Clark. Her new name is Diet Clark, Caitlin broke all her records in college, this season Plum's averaging 17.6 points and 4.4 rebounds, Clark beats her in every single statistical category, points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, percentages, even her best statistic which is free throws, Clark hits a higher percentage of those. And guess what, the Fever are only 3 games behind the Aces, and if you were to swap both of these players teams, put Clark alongside Asia Wilson and Jackie Young, and then put Plum on the Fever, do you really think the records would be as close as they are? And lastly, time to get controversial, the highest rated point guard on ESPN's list, that is Sabrina Ionescu. Now I acknowledge that this one's debatable, Sabrina's having a great year, averaging 19.5 points and with Brianna Stewart last year's MVP struggling with her shot and missing time with injury, she's really stepped up and carried the liberty at times this season. She deserves a ton of credit because they still have the best record in the league. That being said, we are comparing individuals here, and Sabrina, who's considered to be the WNBA's best shooter, shoots a lower percentage from 3 point range and the field than Clark. But everything else, assists, rebounds, steals, blocks, is all Caitlin Clark. And while Sabrina has an argument, Caitlyn over the course of the season is outperforming her statistically, and the fact that we're even comparing her to Sabrina gives validity to the fact that Caitlyn Clark might be the best point guard or guard point blank period in the entire WNBA. And that's not a hot take because when you compare Clark's rookie stats to the other best guards in the league, Clark's are better. And Clark started off slow and didn't actually become one of the best guards until about July. And when you look at her numbers from before and after the All-Star break, before the All-Star break she averaged 17.1 points, 8.2 assists, shot 40% from the field and 32% from 3 point range. The Fever were 11 and 15. And these are her numbers after the All-Star break. She's a completely different player and you can see just by looking at these numbers that she's become one of the WNBA's best players in real time. So the real question is, where does Caitlin Clark rank right now? ESPN had her at 15, that's too low. She's definitely in the top 10, and let's be real, ESPN wouldn't put her in the top 12 because they have to be able to justify Caitlin Clark not being on Team USA this summer. So if you admit that she's a top 12 player, then you admit that she should have been there. And the whole argument on TV to justify her not being there was the fact that she wasn't one of the 12 best players and that the only reason she should have been there was for marketing and to grow the sport. But no, Caitlin Clark is definitely a top 12 player. She's actually probably top 5 and if you really want to go there, Caitlin Clark is possibly the second best player in the WNBA. And if you think that's a hot take, just look at the betting odds for MVP. Caitlin Clark is number 3. Let's look at the best players. If ESPN got one thing right, it's the top of the list. Asia Wilson at number 1, no problem there at all, she's the WNBA's best player right now, has been for the past few years, she won back to back WNBA titles, was finals MVP last summer, is a 2 time defensive player of the year, she's about to win her third regular season MVP, possibly even unanimously, she's averaging the best numbers of her career, she's the reason USA won gold, she's quite clearly the best player in the W, we get that. But the gap between her and the second best player is huge and that's where things start to get interesting because the drop off is so significant there's a bunch of players who could be considered here. ESPN had Brianna Stewart at number 2, I call this the safe pick. She probably is the second best player overall as the MVP last year but since underperforming in the playoffs last season, this season she hasn't been as good. She's in a season long slump from beyond the arc, shooting a career worst 25% from free, she's averaging 19.7 points, 8.7 boards and is still playing at an all star level, but this season she hasn't been the second best player in the WNBA. She probably isn't top 5, but if we're factoring in reputation and who she has been in the past, with 2 MVPs and 2 titles, you can still make the argument for her being number 2. 
At number 3, ESPN had Fee Collier. Not too many complaints here, she's the only other player in the W other than Aja Wilson this season to average more than 20 points and 10 rebounds a game. She belongs somewhere in the top 5 at worst. The Lynx are a top 3 seed, she's the best player on our team, was one of the better players in Paris for Team USA, and when it comes to picking between her and Brianna, reputation or current performance. ESPN then have Alyssa Thomas, another one who's consistently been one of the best players in the WNBA, she's the Swiss Army Knife, averaging 10.7 points, 8.6 rebounds and 7.6 assists while also being one of the best players in the WNBA defensively. The Connecticut Sun are 24-9. and nine. That counts for a lot because she's the best player on that team. But like I said, these three players are pretty interchangeable for the second spot, and all four are universally recognised as top five players. But we still have another spot available in the top five. And are we really going to have a top five list without a guard? The most important position on the court? Like it or not, Caitlin Clark is in the conversation as a top 5 player in the WNBA, and I'll go one further. As the best guard in the league, you can make that argument that she's the second best player right now after Aja Wilson. If you pick any of those three players I just mentioned ahead of her, I'm not going to argue because they are amazing. But if you do think Caitlin Clark's the second best player, I'll hear you out because she does have a really strong case. And anybody denying it at this point is seriously sleeping on Caitlin Clark and what she's accomplished so far in the WNBA. So let me know down below in the comments, how good is Caitlin Clark? I want to see your lists, who are the top 5 players in the WNBA? And I actually have a bigger question. Caitlin Clark is the face of the WNBA and we all know that, but who is the face of basketball? Is there a bigger name in the sport right now, and especially going into the future, men or women's, more popular than Caitlin Clark? Is there anyone from the men's game right now that has the it factor and can move the needle like she does? Well in this video we discuss that conversation in detail and we talk about how Caitlin Clark solved the NBA's biggest problem. If you've made it up to this point in this video, you'll definitely enjoy that one, so click the big box in the middle of your screen to watch that video. If you enjoyed this one, you'll enjoy that one too. Lastly, subscribe to the channel if new around, and on that note it's DKM signing out, until next time, and peace.